Thank you all for coming into the talk, Machine Learning Infrastructure at Facebook Scale. I'd like to introduce to everyone Shivam Baruka. Shivam is an engineer in the AI infrastructure team over at Facebook. He received his bachelor's and bachelor's degree in computer engineering from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. During his time at Facebook, he has helped to scale the machine learning infrastructure at Facebook to support large scale ranking and recommendation models, serving more than a billion users. He is also responsible for driving performance, reliability, and efficiency-oriented designs across the components of the AI infrastructure stack over at Facebook. So thanks so much, Siobhan, for joining us today. I'll turn over the stage to you. Thank you. Yeah, let me just get started. Yeah, th thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Siobhan Baruka, and I'm an engineer in the AI infrastructure team at Facebook, uh, like Jonathan mentioned. Uh, I'll be talking to you about machine learning infrastructure here at Facebook, what are some of the th things we have been working on. And the goal of my talk is to get you excited about the space and in general about Facebook and the work we have been doing. So let's dive right in. Let me go over the rough agenda uh, quickly. So I'll talk a bit about the ML use cases here at Facebook, uh, then dive a bit into the recommendation model. What is different about these models compared to a typical neural network workload? And then uh, I'll talk about the ML execution stages uh, to say what, what are the different stages we use while uh, deploying an ML workload and talk deeply about the training optimizations which we have worked on for the past year or so. And then in the end, I'll cover a bit of the optimization in both the scaling space, uh, in uh, inference space and the data reading space. So let me start by talking about the ML use cases. So as you know, machine learning is everywhere and most major Facebook products and services leverage machine learning. So what this means is like, to give you a few examples, Newsfeed uh, uses ranking algorithms which help people see the stories uh, that matter most to them. Uh, apart from that, ads also leverages ML to determine which ads to display to a given user based on their traits. And there are like other use cases uh, related to language translation, where you can translate a post in uh, the language of your choice. Uh, you can upload images, and Facebook will tell you what who is in the picture amongst your friend list. And then there is side integrity, which is an which is an integral part of the stack, which because it's responsible for detecting misinformation and uh, uh, detecting spam and other stuff. Apart from these use cases, the scale of the workload uh, just from machine learning is huge at Facebook. So to give you an idea, we have hundreds of ranking engineers training thousands of models on a per day basis. And in production itself, we have like hundreds of models which are serving around 100 trillion inferences on a daily basis. And these models like are range from like different types. So we have like transformer models, which are very large and scale up to 10 terabytes. And the hardware itself, which these models run on, uh, there there is a variety of them. We have GPUs, CPUs, special accelerators, uh, and so we in the AI ML infrastructure space, we have to support all of these different uh, variety of workloads. So let's talk about recommendation model and what is different about them. So deep learning recommendation models are the key model at Facebook because it drives the uh, revenue for Facebook through ads and through feed and all those uh, uh, recommendations which you see on the platform. And to give you some context, recommendation models are the single largest AI application in terms of infrastructure uh, demand in our data centers. So as a result, like recommendation models have a very different uh, pattern compared to a typical neural network. And to give you an example, uh, uh, I've attached a what a DLRM model, model looks like. So as you can see, there are there is a combination of both sparse and dense features. So there is a sparse layer, which contains like uh, thousands of embeddings, uh, which are like very data intensive. Uh, and then there is the dense layer, which is uh, more compute intensive, but uh, far less compared to other uh, DNN workloads. So because of this, like DLRM exhibits much le lesser compute intensity and have, uh, compared to like computer vision models or NLP and has a very high memory requirement in terms of both bandwidth and storage. So a lot of the optimizations which we have done in the neural network world 
do not scale to uh, recommendation models. So some of the optimizations you might be aware of, like data parallelism or model parallelism, uh, parallelism are not directly applicable. Uh, to give you an idea, like suppose we take data parallelism. Data parallelism requires that each device save a replica of the entire model uh, in them. But this this is not uh, this cannot be done for recommendation models just because of the sparse layer, which have like trillions of parameters. So you cannot fit a model inside a single node. Similarly, like model parallelism uh, requires that the uh, each training sample uh, is able to uh, train inside one node before like sending the uh, sample to other node. But the embedding uh, parameters they need to be distributed across multiple nodes. So each sample uh, and each sample can require accessing pra these embeddings across uh, the trainers. So you would need uh, communication across multiple trainers in a model parallelism setting itself. Similarly, the hardware, we have optimized uh, uh, hardware a lot through GPUs. They are not particularly designed to match the performance requirements of recommendation models itself. Uh, hardwares are optimized for performing all reduce or they have uh, support for centralized parameter servers, but that is not scalable for recommendation models as I'll show in the next slides. So let me talk about uh, ML execution stages before we uh, deep dive into some of the optimizations we have done. So as you might be aware that you have three major stages. First is the data collection and feature engineering stage, where you're preparing the data for training a model itself. Then the second stage is the training stage itself, where you uh, exp uh, train a model based on the data you have collected in the past. You perform evaluation on how that model is performing uh, based on the data and the predictions which have been collected. And then you deploy the model in production to serve real traffic, which is the inference stage itself. So in this talk, I'll focus mainly on the training optimization. And in the end, I'll mention some of the work we have done in the other stages as well. So to talk about uh, training optimization, uh, a year back, our architecture was based on parameter servers. What this means is um, that we had like separate nodes, trainers, uh, dense parameter servers, and sparse parameters servers, uh, which carry different operations uh, during training. So that, for example, dense parameters uh, were duplicated, duplicated across the trainers it's, uh, itself to exploit data parallelism. And they are responsible for uh, basically um, uh, making sure that you can train inside a trainer and then sync in the background across ten, uh, dense parameter servers. Then you have the sparse parameter servers, which uh, store categorical features and they're distributed across multiple parameter servers. So each trainer would need to communicate uh, with sparse parameter servers while training on a sample itself. And to fully utilize like the trainer CPU cores, uh, we have multi-threading inside them. So this parameter server based approach is actually well suited for recommendation models, but uh, there are certain bottlenecks due to the asynchronous nature of how training is laid out. So in, in order to scale the model, what we needed was we needed to train faster and we did some study on how we can scale an asynchronous parameter server based architecture. And what we found out that if we were able to decouple the number of dense parameters or dense replica from the number of trainers, then we can uh, scale training to a certain extent. So here is the architecture which we proposed. So this architecture is called, uh, we name, call it the hierarchical training architecture in which we basically replace a trainer with a group of nodes. This is similar to how pipeline parallelism is done, but there are certain nuances which make sure that number of dense replicas remain the same while we are able to scale the trainers itself. And this actually helped us scale training uh, by uh, 10x uh, across a few of our uh, major recommendation models. But there is a certain limitation to scaling with uh, asynchronous training. Even with hierarchical training, we were only able to scale up to 10 groups, which is probably equivalent to 60 trainers. In order to further train uh, uh, scale, we realized that asynchronous training introduces a very strong dependency between training throughput and the final model quality. 
So we wanted to move away from that architecture and move to a synchronous training based architecture. And in order, while we were doing so, we wanted to do a, take a software and hardware core design approach where we are able to utilize more powerful hardwares uh, and design them according to the characteristics of our workload while optimizing the software for synchronous steering itself. So this is what we came up with. What we, we on the software side, we uh, approached uh, by taking a parallelism approach on multiple axes. So we explored how we can scale embeddings across multiple dim dimensions. Embeddings are inherently very large and they have multiple rows and columns. And based on a certain embedding, you can either uh, spread them across multiple trainers such that they are uh, there are like rows uh, which are spread across multiple trainers or there are columns which are spread across the trainer itself. So we designed a uh, software algorithm which can uh, take an embedding and decide what is the best approach to partition the embedding itself across these trainers. And you, you can do it across like four dimensions. You can uh, spread an embedding, an entire uh, embedding table. You can uh, take a row-wise approach. You can take a column-wise approach, or you can take a data parallelism approach. Apart from just do a scaling, uh, spreading the embeddings, uh, we also applied in uh, pipelining to our uh, software. So what that meant is there is a lot of communication overhead while uh, we are uh, by, when we do model parallelism for embeddings itself. You have to do all-to-all -all communication. You have to do reduce scatter. So we overlap the computation stage for one batch with the communication stage for the other batch. Now, keeping all these software optimization in mind, we designed our architecture, which we call the Zion architecture. Zion architecture basically leverages multiple levels of memory to fit our embedding tables while also providing a dedicated uh, network so that our accelerators, which are like GPU based, can communicate without like going through the CPU itself. So we have like dedicated RDMA uh, over like e converge Ethernet, which can provide uh, very high bandwidth for uh, GPU to GPU connection uh, uh, communication. And this helped us scale uh, training by 40x for our models. And uh, there is a paper which I've attached to this uh, slide, which talks a lot about uh, lot in detail about this architecture itself. Now moving on to other optimization. Like I said, apart from training, we also need to think about optimizing the data reading stage and the inference stage. So we uh, did some work in both of these areas. So for data reading, what we realized is we uh, wanna decouple data ingestion from uh, data processing inside uh, training. So wh what we created was a dis disaggregated storage and data ingestion pipeline. And this is critical for both our training and inference stack. Um, and there were other uh, software optimizations which we were able to do apart from just uh, splitting these stages. We were able to explore how, how we can compress the features, how we can uh, perform some kind of reordering on the feature such that there is uh, we can reduce the bandwidth requirements of reading data during training. So apart from data reading, we also worked on scaling our inference architecture. So Something critical about inference is they require us to be more energy efficient. View, uh, the, we do inference uh, in real time for serving real traffic. So for this, we designed special uh, accelerators, uh, which are optimized for like sparse memory access and for large model sizes. And we prefer, performed optimization across multiple axes uh, while designing these inference accelerators. We perform model level optimization, which is basically a training. Even though a training model is very large in size, we quantize into a very uh, it into a very small size, such that it can fit in a single node or a bunch of uh, few nodes instead of taking like sixty trainers, which we use uh, during training itself. Then we performed uh, accelerator level optimizations, uh, which are, which are related to model partitioning, how we allocate resources between different partitions of the model. Uh, uh, and then we also looked at like what optimizations can be done at the compiler level to optimize how uh, these nodes are being are communicating with each other. Now, overall, what this means uh, for our training. 
with all these efforts, we were able to scale training by 40x, and we were we are able to now support 12 terabyte recommendation models. But this is not where we want to stop. There are more and more complex and demanding models which are coming in the pipeline, and uh, ML uh, machine learning space itself is evolving a lot. So we want to take a more holistic course, hardware and software core design approach as we go forward. And what this means is we want to support 100x to 1000x scale in both model size and complexity as we as we uh, move ahead. So this is all I have. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. All right, thanks so much, Bob, for coming today and sharing to us how ML infrastructure is being implemented at Facebook. So for everyone else in the chat, if you'd like to drop any questions in the session and the chat, um, we will pose them to Shivam. We have one question from um, Ganesan. This person asks, how do you optimize different methods of parallelism? So I guess the question uh, points toward like different methods of parallelism uh, in terms of both model parallelism, data parallelism, and pipeline parallelism. So what we do is like we like I said, we take a hardware and software code design approach here. Uh, based on like our workload characteristics, we see how what kind of parallelism is good for a certain uh, sector of our ML workload. So suppose there is there are sparse parameters which are more memory intensive, we apply uh, model parallelism there. Then there are dense para parameters which are more compute heavy and but like smaller in terms of uh, um, memory requirements. So we take a data parallelism approach for them. Uh, and then when we are running a tra uh, compute training, uh, if we see that there is uh, a lot of uh, scope for pipelining, like you can overlay uh, certain stages of training with other, across batches, then we take pipeline parallelism approach there. So it's uh, it's it's a holistic approach on how your workload is uh, laid out, and right now a lot of this is done manually. Like we, after looking at the workloads, we say that okay, this part should be uh, uh, done using pipeline parallelism, or this part should take model parallelism into account. But we are also exploring uh, auto parallelism uh, for our models, which will uh, look at a workload, run a smaller version of that workload on a few trainers and determine what kind of parallelism is suitable for which part of the model and apply that automatically. That's coming in the pipeline. Looks like, uh, yeah, it looks like you answered all the questions so far in the chat. If there are, are no others, then we'll call it a day here. But thank you so much for coming in today and talking to us at MLOps. For everyone else in the chat, be sure to check out some of the booths and our sponsors. There are a lot of really interesting companies and also giveaways that you can find over there. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in.